Hope you guys are reading as you're waiting. We've advanced. We actually have announcements on the board here. So take a look at them as you're sitting and waiting. We'll be starting in just a few minutes, okay? Hi, everybody. Hey, <laughs> Welcome to the Science Cafe. Sorry, that's way too tall. Yes, I'm short. Okay. So, one of the things, there's lots of announcements. This is our fifth season for the Science Cafe. Thank all you guys for coming and supporting the Science Cafe and to the Office of Research here on campus and Sigma Xi. And of course, we always want to thank the 1804 Fund, which gave us the initial grant to get this started. Um, I'm Sarah Wyatt. I am the Vice President of Sigma Xi, which is the Honorary Research Society. It's a national society. And as we <laughs> move towards the spring, we'll be talking about how you can become a member if you wish. Um, so we'll talk more about that later. Um, today, we have the first of our 2013-2014 uh, season, Janet Doerr, and she's going to talk about these cool little worms that are squiggling around up there and the research that she does with them. Uh, next week, we have Larry Whitmer. No. No? Two no. weeks. Two weeks. I'm sorry. Next week, we have John Gilliam. Right. <laughs> Just a minute. <laughs> In two weeks, we have the next Science Cafe, which is Larry Whitmer, and it's going to be all about dinosaurs. Uh, this is a repeat performance. We did this one in year one, and trust me, it's worth coming to see. Um, next week, we have the Cafe Conversations, same time, same place, and this is John Gilliam from PolySoft? Yep. Political Science. Talking about Big Brother and the Surveillance Society. Big Brother and the Surveillance Society. Yes. Okay. So another talk worthy of coming to. So you get, get all these things on your uh, calendar. Five o'clock on Wednesday, you should just come here just in case we're doing something, right? All right. So with that, oh, T-shirt. <laughs> they used to give me a list, and now <laughs> she just... Yeah. All right. So the other thing you need to know, which is important, is we have T-shirts. We always have t-shirts. This year's t-shirt. Um, 
<laughs> How do you win a t-shirt, Sarah? <laughs> so the question is, in your mind, how do I get one, right? Mm -hmm. All you have to do is participate. Ask a question, or if she asks for participation, people who participate in Science Cafe get t-shirts. Pretty simple deal, actually. So with that, I'll e take it over to Janet. OK, uh, yeah, I'm on. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. I know it's kind of unpleasant in here. Um, but I want, I'm glad you're here. I would like to share some of the cool things I know about, I do, and I'm excited about that all involve this little critter. Oh, and I better have an advancer thing. Oh. Well, hey, could you be my advancer? Oh, no, I'll do that. Sure. I can do that. Um, okay. So, yeah, genes, are we just big smart worms? And I'm, I'm going to talk about worms and worm brains, and I'm also going to talk about using worms to study drugs. And uh, I want to actually acknowledge the fact this is going on with a lot of people in my lab, some of whom are here. Test, who are the wormies? <laughs> and yes, I do call them the wormies, OK. <laughs> Um, and that's my critter, and hopefully by the end you'll love him as much as I do, him, her. Okay, next, please. Um, could you start the show? Uh-oh. Click on the video. If you know how to do, uh-oh, she doesn't know how to do this. We need somebody who's more tech savvy. <laughs> okay, so, you know, actually this is like the question for my mom. Yeah, right, what? Sorry. I forgot an announcement. <laughs> Sorry, guys. And I need to make this announcement. We are taping the Science Cafe this oh, year. Yeah. So the, the, the shot is really tight. It's mostly on this. If you happen to get in the video, we will ask you for a permission slip. That's pretty much all you need to know. If there's anybody that just absolutely refuses, doesn't want to be on tape, is sure they don't want to be caught on tape, all you have to do is scoop back a little bit and you won't be in the shot at all. Okay? This will be streamed somewhere, yes. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, the idea is to be able to show these because there's been a lot of requests for people that can't attend to get to see these, okay? So we'll make more announcements later as we figure out exactly how to see these in addition. We also have a Facebook page and Twitter in case you didn't know about those things. And I truly apologize, Janet, for interrupting you. That's it just okay. It occurred to me. <laughs> yeah, it's a new thing trying to do the live streaming, so we'll see how it works. Um, yeah, but how cool to start with worms, right? So, yeah, like I say, this is something like my mom says, but are worms really animals? And I'm like, well, mom, she's not a biologist, but I'm like, well, mom, what are there? There's plants, there's animals, bacteria, fungi, they're animals, okay? They've got the animal thing going, they move around, they find stuff to eat, they interact with their neighbors, <laughs> sometimes violently. And so if we're interested in studying behavior at the very, very, very simplest level, that's why we can use these. These are about as simple as you can get and have all the parts that make you an animal. Okay, so. We'll get you to go through this so I can stand up that. You just have to advance through. Um, yeah. Okay, not to scale. <laughs> Here is a human showing actually the nerves and a little bit of the bones. And that's my worm. And if you can advance. Uh-oh, somebody. Okay, so this is the us versus them. Yeah, we're both animals. We're quite different. Uh, first off, what do we have that they do or don't have? Yeah, we're normal size, okay, right? It's all relative to us. <laughs> relative to us, the worms are tiny. I actually sent my husband off to bring them. They're a millimeter. So that means if you're nearsighted, you can see them no problem like this. If you're uh, more elderly and you have to read like this, <laughs> then no, you can't see them. They're little tiny things and they're translucent. Okay, next, where do they live in the soil normally? 
where you guys, most of you live in the dorms. I don't know, which would you prefer? <laughs> but these guys live in like the forest where the soils decay, has lots of decaying matter, and they eat the little bacteria that are living in the soil. In the lab, we can just grow them on a dish, a little dish, or in a little well, a tiny little space. And yeah. OK, so what is the life of an animal? The whole life of an animal is it actually has to seek out food, find it, consume it. Um, and for C. elegans, actually, there's bacteria all over the place. Um, but the soil in the wintertime, it can be hard to get enough food. So they have a stressful life. I don't know compared to you guys. And then, yeah. They have predators, so mites. Ooh, sometimes mites get infection in, in, infections in the lab, and then they just go from dish to dish, and they eat all the nematodes. Bad. Um, there are also fungi that eat nematodes. Okay, And there's actually some bacteria that they eat by mistake, and then the bacteria eats them up from inside. OK, so it's not all you know, fun and games. I don't know what you're avoiding. <laughs> I thought of something to put up there, but I just left that blank. OK, so, and then what do animals do? They have to have a place to live. They have to um, find their food, avoid nasty things, and then they have to make more. And we'll just leave this at the, the little symbols here for the reproduction. So I think one of the really, really cool things about nematodes is they're actually hermaphrodites. But they are, hmm, non-obligate, self-fertilizing hermaphrodites. What the heck is that? That means if they're all alone in the woods, in the soil, there's nobody but them, they can fertilize themselves, and they can make little babies that are just like them. And a typical worm can have 200 babies that are all just like her, her, him, her. But there are also a few males out there roaming. Maybe one out of a thousand worms in the wild is a male. And it can mate with a hermaphrodite. So a male actually spend much more time looking for hermaphrodites. That's basically their life. Hermaphrodite, as long as she has food, she can make her own babies. She, he. But a male can only ha reproduce if it can find hermaphrodites. So there's a lot of interesting ecology behavior stuff going on. Um, there's more comparisons where we're getting to the, like, the lab part of it for us. OK, so genes. This is what I'm, I use, I study, I'm interested in. You guys, 2,253 worms, not that far behind. OK, so that little tiny critter that barely has to do anything has about the same number of genes that we do. And this was actually like a lot of big wig scientists lost big bets. Because they thought when this, this was the first genome sequenced, and when that came out, they said, oh, 20,000 genes per worm, 200,000 for us, no problem. OK? And then it turned out, oops, for a while there were fewer in humans, but they upped it a little bit. So basically, in terms of all the design elements you need. So what are the genes that are going to encode all the little machines that make the organism work? So right, it is the code for all the parts that are going to make the machine. And it turns out to be a tiny little animal, stupid, tiny, short life, takes actually almost as many genes as it does to take be one of us marvelous people. And if you look ahead at the proteins, if you actually look, most of the proteins are similar in us and them. And you know, they have a gut, they have digestive things, they have, actually they get sick. <laughs> um, they sniff out their friends or their enemies. And to do this, they have to have a brain. But here is a really big difference. They have exactly the same brain from one mom and daughter and daughter, 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 granddaughter, they all have exactly the same brain cells. Always the same, 302, OK? Um, and they all have names. And they're pretty boring. It's like ADL. OK, well, 
we have, see, I have to actually check this when I put it up. 1,000 million billion, 100 billion neurons in our brain. Okay, maybe some of you guys have 200 billion. <laughs> I don't really know. And so we can do a lot more with our brains. We can do all this stuff. Oh, oh wait, yeah, so here's, here's husband with his 100 billion brain cells. <laughs> Why don't you just um, draw the lid, dry the lids for me? You need a, here, worms, me. Okay, so the brain, the neurons. We know pretty much we have a whole bunch of our neurons up here. They're going to do all these thought things that I'm not going to worry about. Well, I worry about, but I don't study. Okay, cognition, higher order reasoning, dreaming. We do those things. But that's not the most basic things that neurons have to do. The most basic things neurons have to do is move the animal and sense the environment. Okay? And so basically, here's a little diagram of one neuron that goes from our spinal cord out to a muscle in our leg. And that one cell, that one neuron, when our brain decides that we want to kick our leg, it's going to send a message down through that neuron, and it's going to communicate with the muscle. So the, we do that. The messages have to travel really far. We can't do things that fast. Um, if you're a worm and you're a millimeter long, you also have to decide if you're going to move to the right or to the left or up or down. The message doesn't go very far, but it goes by the same kinds of mechanisms. The same genes are involved, the same proteins, same kinds of cells. Okay, so I'm the, neur the neuron in my brain wants to tell my fingers to wiggle. Okay, there has to be, there's a neuron that goes all the way down to the muscles in my finger, and then there has to be communication from the neuron to the muscle now it's time to move, contract, or relax. And so that's all going to be with neurotransmission, where the neuron is going to transmit information to the next cell, be it a muscle or another neuron on your brain. And it's going to do that by releasing little chemicals. It has a store of chemicals and neurotransmitters. And when, it's, when I tell, my brain tells my fingers it's time to go, the neuron is releasing the neurotransmitter, hits the muscle, and the muscle has receptors that are going to make it contract. Okay, so this is the part where I, which I study, which I'm interested in, and this is the part where drugs come to play. That is most of the drugs, brain type drugs, neural drugs. Okay, so here we have these, neuro, these chemicals. They will be released. When they're told to be released, they'll be received. And then actually what happens is these chemicals can be recycled or they can be destroyed. And that's how come you contract the muscle, but then you relax, okay? So I just, my husband suggested this. It's been a lot in the news. Acetylcholine. Do you guys, how many people actually have heard of acetylcholine? Yeah. So everybody already knows all the stuff about neurotransmission. So where is acetylcholine, what is it used for neurotransmission between what cells? Muscle. See, ah, see, talked up, see? If you talk up, you got a t-shirt. <laughs> okay, so all this wiggling I am walking I do as I talk um, is a reflection of my background and also the reflection that I have plenty of acetylcholine to release. But the reason I chose this quite in the news because of a particular drug that's been in the news, a weapon of mass destruction, sarin. Okay, so why has sarin been in the news? Not so fun. Yeah, so this is the um, traces of sarin have been found in hair from people who were from Syria, where in the village where all the 1,400 people died. Okay, what did the sarin do? It was released, and it mimics acetylcholine, except it doesn't stop, okay? So it makes everything, all the muscles and everything contract at once. There's no release. It's just, right, terrible. Okay, so these 
Uh, drugs <laughs> can range in ve very much in their effects from being totally deadly. That's not what I study in my lab. I don't really want anything where a tiny amount will cause all my students to seize up and die. So <laughs> we concentrate on some other kinds of neurotransmitters that do more subtle things. Serotonin. People heard of serotonin? Yes. Okay. That's what it looks like. So these little pictures here are the drawings of the chemical itself. It's pretty simple. If you know what it looks, I mean, if you can read what that diagram is, but it is a simple chemical. It's actually really easy to make. Um, it could have existed in the primordial ooze way back when. It's fairly simple. Okay, next picture. Uh, what is, yeah, it's involved in sleep and mood. Huh. And probably most of you guys have heard about it in relation to drugs. So what's the kind, do you, who knows what kind of drugs people take that alter serotonin? Prozac. Prozac. Ooh, yeah, Prozac. Okay, so if, I think the next bullet, yeah. Sorry, you can't just take the lecture out of the, uh, of the professor. <laughs> oh, this is scary. I just looked this up. I thought I know a lot of people take antidepressants in the United States. How many? And I just looked up on the CDC website, 11% of peop people over the age 12 in the United States take antidepressants. That's very, very high. For adults, it's the most commonly prescribed drug. Okay? And most of those, not, there are different kinds of antidepressants, but most of those influence serotonin. So yeah, here are some of the names, but there's like 20 different names. Some of them are generic. And here's an example of what one of these looks like. It really doesn't look that close. So basically what this does, or any of these drugs do, it, it goes to where normally it goes into your brain. It goes where the serotonin is normally active. But instead of doing the normal things that serotonin does, it gets in there and it blocks up the site. So this can fit in the site where that normally goes, but then it doesn't come out. It just stays there. Blocking. Okay, so what the, the select, these are, the next slide, called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So that's what the an, most antidepressants are called SSRIs. That stands for selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, which means what? Serotonin is the chemical that's released, and normally, it's released, and then it's taken back up and recycled. So normally, when you're, you know, thinking thoughts or you're startled awake or you're getting sleepy, what's changing is the amount of serotonin you release in your brain all over. And normally, most of it's released, and most of it is taken back up, and that's how the signaling stops. When you take one of these drugs, and it's all in this space, it actually plugs the reuptake places. So the serotonin's released, and then it just stays there, and it stays there because the way that it's supposed to be taken back up to clear is plugged. So it is the reuptake inhibitor. There are many, many different kinds. They all have a part that looks like serotonin that fits in here. But they differ in how well they stick, how long they stay, and therefore the effects they have or side effects that they have. Okay, so um, the other, so serotonin is one of the drugs we study in my lab. Um, and yeah, it has very serious effects on people's mood, but you don't, it's not a nerve gas type neurotransmitter. It's more, um, modulates the way we feel. So people who might have too much or too much little serotonin might be hyperactive or very sleepy or have trouble sleeping, depressed, anxious. All those conditions are, are correlated with changes in serotonin. Okay, the other similar, so I, we also study in the lab and many thousands of people study a similar neurotransmitter called dopamine. Okay, so, hmm. 
This is kind of, I won't ask, but with a crowd this size, there's good chance that somebody knows an older person who has a dopamine problem. In uh, Alzheimer's disease, yes, there can be problems in dopamine and the move, regulation of mo movement. Anybody else know another disease? Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease, in Parkinson's disease, most of the dopamine neurons in your brain die, okay? And you no longer, dopamine doesn't, it's not like this, like acetylcholine makes me move my fingers, the muscles talk to my brain. The dopamine is like my brain being ready to move. So I don't know, like I say, in a group this size, people might, at least some of you know someone with Parkinson's disease. And one of the early symptoms is when they aren't thinking about it, they shake, they tremor. And when they do think about it, they can move smoothly. And then when they don't think about it, they tremor again. Okay, so it's not the regulation. It's, again, sort of higher order thinking. What am I going to do not actually controlling the doing? Now, as you progress in Parkinson's, it becomes very hard to start moving. So if you actually look at a patient with Parkinson's and you ask them to walk, they will not be able to start for a while, and then they will start, and they will keep going, and sometimes they will actually just walk right to the wall on the other end. So very terrible disease, a very specific, well, it's not, it is relatively specific for a neurological disease. And this is um, the major treatment for Parkinson's disease. And it actually will, um, has extended life expectancy of Parkinson's patients for about 10 years. So the disease still progresses. But this is a pre, uh, you can see it's related, it's similar, okay? And this is L-DOPA, it's given to patients who have Parkinson's disease, and it can make the symptoms less severe for a number of years. You have to keep increasing the dose of the drug, and eventually you get side effects that are so severe you can't use it anymore. Okay, so um, the converse, so Parkinson's disease, some of the things we study are related to L-DOPA. The opposite is too much dopamine, or just enough dopamine, okay? The dopamine rush, anybody know what I'm talking about? Well, maybe you know, but <laughs> do you not know? You can get it from working out. That is a really good way to do it. Finding out you won the lottery, some reward, especially an unexpected reward, you get that rush, ooh, yes. And what you actually have is your dopamine cells are being activated, normally activated. How about this? This is one of the most abused drugs in our area, methamphetamine. This is where maybe once in a while you hear about somebody blowing up their trailer. They're cooking up meth. And so you can cook it up because you can make it from common precursors that you can buy. But this, so when you take methamphetamine, what it does is it makes all the dopamine release all at once in your brain. Poof. Okay? It's like super maximal rush, but then it's all like released. All the dopamine's released. It can't be taken back up. So then you go woo, and then you go whoosh. Okay? Because you don't have the dopamine normal levels of dopamine in your brain for the normal levels of happiness. And what happens with addicts is that they keep taking this and they deplete more and more deplete the normal levels in their brain so that they become what there's actually a psychology phrase, anhedonic, that is they do not feel pleasure. And each rush will get less and less. Okay, so that, I think there's a picture. Look how close. This, it's like one little part different. This is one of the most prescribed drugs for young people under 12. That is, this is amphetamine as opposed to methamphetamine. It's almost the same thing. 
It is the main component of Adderall and Ritalin, commonly prescribed for um, ADHD. Okay, so I'm absolutely, totally positive <laughs> that you guys in this crowd know there are many people who know kids who are taking these medications. Um, what this do does, it actually changes the dopamine, but it changes it very slightly and specifically at certain places. So, to really understand the different drugs and their interactions with the cells, you need to know what their targets are exactly and how the reaction to the drugs changes over time. Okay, do you become um, addicted or tolerant or do you need more and more of a drug that's a prescribed drug? And that's all part of how the neurons are signaling and how they receive those signals and they respond to the changes during signaling. Okay? Okay, that's people. That's like, I'm interested in people and diseases, but I actually love to work on my little worms. I don't want, I don't in my lab ha interact with people who need medications, I hope. Okay. <laughs> I mean, if they do and they're all fine and, and then they have the right amount of medications, that's good. What I actually want to do is understand those, those molecules, what they are doing to the cells, and how that changes over time. And so this is the brains I study. This is my worm. And this is actually each green spot is one cell. Oh, the red part shows where the neurons are. So this is the brain of my worm. Pretty nice, huh? It's got 150 cells in it, almost like 100 billion. And then this is the spine of the worm. And then this is the butt brain, OK? So like a lot of animals, it gets another little brain back here that helps determine uh, when it's going to poop. OK, so important, important <laughs> behaviors for the worm. And if we go, uh, yeah, so these, the worms respond to the same kinds of drugs and the same kinds of neurotransmitters that we do. These are actually, this is so the more severe case. These are worms where we've messed with acetylcholine, okay? And she can click on the movies, oops, the movies, they're both movies. Back. Okay, this is. It could be one of two things. I know which one it is, but you couldn't really tell by looking at it whether it was a worm that was put on one of the drugs like sarin, or in this case, actually, it is a mutant where I have made a change in the normal target for sarin. Okay? So it's, and you can see life is not good. Okay? Um, this one, if you could click on this one, this is a nicotine worm. Just thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> so you can actually get the same kind of behavior either by putting worms on nicotine <laughs> and or you can actually knock out one, change one specific target of nicotine in the worms and get the same behavior. So this is what the wormy worm genome part is. We can use the worms to see where the drugs are active, compare the activity of the drugs with the changes in the mutants. We can do mix and match. And we can see how the worm compensates for, say, a change in the nicotine receptor over its lifetime. Yes, sir? Right, so there are some mutants where the males uh, cannot find the hermaphrodites, so they have a very sad life. Um, some of, actually, some of my mutants, the males can find the hermaphrodites, but they can't do anything about it. So basically, you can only keep them going in the lab because the hermaphrodites will keep going. And the males have a life of futility. They basically eat, and then they might bump into the hermaphrodite, and then too bad. So um, that's, but that's like the most complicated things they have to do. Okay. Okay, so again, the simplicity. 
how can, why study dopamine and serotonin? Because this is a worm, so if you can do the next. There's eight dopamine neurons, these, and there's eight serotonin neurons. And we know them. They're identical from worm to worm. We know what behaviors they control. This is, this is just the dopamine cells. See, it's way few. This is like the least abundant neurotransmitter. There's only 400,000 neurons that use dopamine. So when somebody takes a drug that changes dopamine levels, you can measure changes in the activity of the brain, but the, the scale of those changes, the smallest that we can measure in a whole human brain is 10,000 cells changing at a time. So you can't really see all the molecular stuff. Okay, so, oh, yeah, so my husband said I should quiz you here. So click on this one. This is a normal worm. This is their food. And that's a worm coming from no food. Mm. That's what they're doing all the time. They're t oh, and this movie is still going. You can see this guy is still moving, but this one is just going, hmm. Okay. Here is a worm where the dopamine and serotonin are messed up. Looks pretty good, right? Happy, healthy, stupid, okay? This is what these, this neurotransmitters do for a worm normally. They help it change and react to its environment. So it will eat, but it doesn't like stop and enjoy the roses, okay? And what would this mean in the wild? It would be toast, right? Because you need to stay near the food in the wild. I mean, you can't just like depend on there to be cafeterias everywhere and just keep wandering and eating whenever you bypass. So in the wild, you never find mutants with the defect in the dopamine because they would just pass right by the food. But in the lab, we can make them. We can totally knock out all the dopamine. And all the worms do is we need to give them lots of food. <laughs> Okay, and not ask them to reproduce. I mean, not ask for males. Okay, so. Um, so we can study, and there are people, so there's like thousands of worm labs, believe it or not. And there are dozens of worm labs that study different neurotransmitters and do the same kinds of things I do. There's lab, there's a whole lab at St. Louis that studies um, selective serotonin reuptake in health. Okay, there's two labs that study actually acetylcholine signaling. Um, we study, we actually are studying, using mutants to study these, this set of neurotransmitters, and in particular, how they interact with these drugs on the bottom. You can see they look similar, but different, right? That's kind of the drug thing. What are these? These are things called monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Okay, so there's only like a few hundred thousand people taking these in the United States as opposed to millions, okay? But that's still a lot of people. Now, the thing about drugs, it's just kind of scary. Even prescribed drugs, so these are prescribed for conditions and they're including prescribed for Parkinson's disease. The tr scary thing about prescribed drugs, if, if they have been around long enough, they've been grandfathered in, they don't have to go through all the same testing. First, they have to be safe for people to use, but you don't actually have to know exactly everything they do. You just have to know that if you give them to people, it will help alleviate Parkinson's symptoms. But right now, for example, with this particular drug, there are two sets of people who are actually arguing in, in the Journal of American Medical Association about whether giving this helps the patients over a 10-year period or actually hurts the patient. So this is kind of the scary thing about prescription drugs. We do short-term tests. One year, so a six-month test. We do a long-term test. We might check for five years. How long are people taking some of these drugs? Starting when they are 15 until they die of whatever they die of. Okay, so we are doing this experiment on ourselves. There's a lot of people who need these drugs. <laughs> but, um, and so it's a cost-benefit thing, but we would like to find out as much as possible as we can from our little wormies 
what are the possible consequences of the long-term effects, okay? So that's what we do. Now, luckily for us, the long-term in us, 60 years. Long-term in a worm, a week, okay? They are very fast. <laughs> they actually die of old age in about 20 days. So um, I have the next one. So here is the other part of it. This is a prescribed, like I say, selegiline is, is being um, prescribed by one set of physicians treating Parkinson's patients and not being pres prescribed by another set. This I just copied from the Mayo Clinic website, the list of side effects, okay? From, um, if you have these, please immediately go to the hospital for overdose, but you can see <laughs> Some of these are very strange, puffing of the cheeks, okay? Not all of these are like such that you would immediately have to go to the emergency room, okay? Um, rapid movements of the tongue, and I cut out including worm-like movements, okay? But if you look at this set of side effects, you can mm, map some of them to known effects of dopamine. But some of them really just don't make sense. And some of them probably involve interactions with other substances in our body, genes, proteins, that we have not identified. You can't, like, take a person who suddenly is having rapid movements of the tongue. You can't figure out what target that is in that person that's making them, that one person do that particular behavior. So part of what we do is, again, we take these drugs, we put them on our worms, and we can look at the, um, a lot of different mutants that affect a lot of different things and see what does this drug normally act on besides monoamine oxidase? What other things could it be acting on? And can that inform the people who are prescribing it or the people who are designing the medications to know that, oh yes, actually this one also acts on an octopamine chloride channel that is present in worms in this cell, but in people in this area, okay? That is sort of the cosmic, not just worms are cool thing that we are thinking about. And there's just a couple more. The, the sort of the scariest thing um, for the prescribed drugs, I mean, there's lots of scary things about drugs of abuse, but for the prescribed drugs, kind of scary thing that we are aware of is the, the taking, changing the drug through early development can have serious consequences for the development of the nervous system. So what do I mean? This is a normal worm where I've just lit up seven cells. These are seven of the 302 neurons. They're labeled with green color. And they are the neurons that go all the way up and down and the worm feels when it, you bump into the worm, it makes it go, ah, okay? So they are really important for evading predators. And this is how they normally look. And this is if you um, change the serotonin levels in, in the babies. It looks almost right. I mean, the worms look pretty good. But if you actually look at any one cell, they have small errors. Whoa, what does this mean for the worm? It just means it wouldn't move quite as well, like 95% normal, 95% responsiveness. But um, figuring out, again, what kinds of cells are sensitive to this is something we care, I care about in a more cosmic way because there are many people in the United States who take SSRIs during pregnancy. And I, you know, I have a friend who did, and she had to, because if she didn't take them, she was suicidal, okay? She wanted to have a baby. She went down to as low a level as possible, and why as low a level as possible? Um, because her baby was developing. She didn't want it to be 95% of the neurons exactly correct, okay? She wants 105%. <laughs> um, that kind of research, from the very basic worms and then in mice and then in people, you give the recommendations. Again, there's always a cost benefit for the prescribed drugs. She couldn't, if she had totally gone off them, 
she probably, yes, it would not have helped her baby in utero, right? So trying to get the right one as small and level as possible with a knowledge. Yeah, her, right, I knew her. She was my friend, so, right, she was like a science nerd, too. So she knew what she would have sort of to weigh the cost benefits. A lot more difficult for um, Joe Schmo or Jane Schmo on the street getting this medication. You know, you hear all these things. Women hear all these things when they're pregnant. You can't smoke. You can't drink. You're not supposed to have coffee. Or you can have one cup of coffee or whatever. Stop taking this. Start taking this. But this is the kind of test we can do. We can't do tests. We don't want to do her to be doing tests on her babies. We want to be doing the tests on this. OK. I think that, yeah, here's some. Oh, this is like an old lab picture. But yeah, uh, this is. This is why you should come work in my lab, because I give treats that have worms on them to my students. <laughs> um, I want to end with a little video that's just running in the background while I'm going. I think that's it. Oh, let's see. OK, escape, escape. And let's see if this will w run from here. This is like the totally cool people. <laughs> okay, so this is the other thing that actually they're using the worm to try and recreate and model the entire nervous system. So there's like n major, see, look how beautiful. This is her hermaphrodite. She's got her babies developing in her. How nice. I don't know if they show a male. This is what the little babies look like as they're developing. You can see they're almost like little worms. They're still in their egg. Shape, shells. So yeah, the, in the last 10 years, there have been a couple Nobel Prizes. And one of them uh, um, was for studying early development in worms. Oh, uh oh. Let's see. Keep playing. Why aren't you playing? OK. Hatching. How often do you get to see a worm hatch? <laughs> and this is a model of all the neurons in the worm going down the body. OK, here's, we know what this is. <laughs> He's giving like the same spiel as me, except he has magical 3D rotation. And here's my worm. OK. Uh, these are the dopamine cells and the, ha, yes, my cells. OK. <laughs> so this is what's called the Open Worm Project. So this is part of the whole science. That's why there's thousands of people who are studying this. And yeah, I'm sorry I wasn't as act interactive as I was supposed to be. It's hot. It's hot. It's really hot. <laughs> um, but I would love to take questions. And thank you for still being here when it's all. Oh, yeah. You used it to wipe the worm plates. Yeah, pass around the worms. Oh, he's going to pass around the worms. OK, so if you look, like I say, you have to be like the nearsighted person and look for tiny little white moving dots. Look through the bottom. Look through the bottom. OK, Marilyn. Uh, so, yeah, so there was a question about taking a vitamin B12 for Alzheimer's disease. The problem with, with Alzheimer's disease is that too many of the cells are all dying at the same time. Um, for some people, older people, there's also vitamin defects that go along with it. But the only prescribed medication right now for delaying onset of symptoms is actually changes acetylcholine in your brain, OK? Um, it's not very effective. Again, it only, the Parkinson's disease works because it's that 400,000 cells only, basically, that are dying. In Alzheimer's disease, it's like a half of the brain, at least, that is showing degeneration. Yes, ma'am? 
the mutant? Um, the first ones, okay, so yeah, so how about these chemical mimics? Are they things that we can isolate from good tea or herbal remedies? Are these things that um, we make? And so it started out that the first groups were actually isolated. Um, you could actually isolate some of them from fungi. But now, especially like designer labs, both legal and illegal, they basically just add, randomly add things to the same basic neurotransmitter shape and then throw it on something or give it to somebody. Uh, yeah. Can you point out how other, how other they can all bite or they can go up on the neck with it and on the neck? Yeah, so this is a, a neuro person who wants to know, I'm going to, <laughs> ma'am, a neuro person who wants to know if, if his specific kinds of cells are found, uh, neurotransmitters are found, GABA and glycine and electrical synapses. And GABA, yes, glycine, we don't know as much about. Um, probably GABA does most of the things that GABA and glycine do in us. And there's lots of electrical synapses, which might not mean that much to. Okay, I can, I can imitate a worm doing whatever if you want. <laughs> Somebody ask a question because there's still t-shirts. Somebody extra large is asking. Somebody extra large extra ask a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, now we're going to start selecting our <laughs> There's a question back there. Yes, sir. Okay, we actually, I actually, Amanda right there is putting what, quest, what kinds of experiments are we doing right now? Amanda right there is um, setting up some worms um, tomorrow on the drugs, and she's going to let them go through a full generation. And she's actually with different concentrations, and she's going to see, like, observe as much as she can. So we already know there's, like, short-term effects, but we really don't know what the babies will be like. So she's actually just doing those experiments right now. Yeah. So her, ex okay, so the, the actual execution of each experiment might be a, a couple weeks. The actual making of the mutants to test specific ideas about what genes are important may take six months. Okay, so there's a lot of upfront time. We have to predict what is the, what do we think might be important. Then we change it and then she does experiments or someone does experiments fairly rapidly. But even with just a simple nervous system, there's still 20,000 genes, so you still have to sort of narrow that down a little bit. You throw out the ones that have no hope of interacting with your molecule, and then you end up with a set of known things and then other like mystery things that might possibly, they're found in neurons, but we don't know what they do. Okay. Yes, ma'am. It's pretty easy. You put the drug. What? Yeah. How do you give them the drugs? You can just put the drugs in a little bit of saline and you drop the worms right in. And they're just swimming in it, actually. And then they start, or whatever there it is they're going to do. What's the biggest challenge that you have? The biggest ch challenge that we face <laughs> is um, actually when things aren't what we predicted, okay, how do we go from there? So we had certain idea, this particular gene was gonna be important. One of my students, he's not here, probably he's just too sad, invested a whole lot of time in making the protein and trying to characterize its interactions and it doesn't do what we thought it did. And then, now that's a lot of, okay, this is gonna be exciting if we figure it out. Very, very exciting. If we don't figure it out, very, very sad. <laughs> okay, so the paperwork for worms, they are animals, but as far as the federal government is concerned, they are not animals, okay? We don't have to do any of the paperwork. So that's kind of interesting. 
like frogs are, are animals, but um, worms are not, flies are not animals, according to the rules. And it actually says that. All animals are regulated, and then, but it only means mice and rats and vertebrates. Another reason to use worms. Not very much of my research so far. We have actually, so my, the research, what I did research with acetylcholine. Um, the biggest application was actually, we were the first people to figure out how the acetylcholine was transported. And it's just transported the same way in people. And it's actually defective in some families with an inherited form of um, muscular dystrophy. Okay. Yes. When I was uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, one of the things that we had to do for clinical testing was gender-specific tests. Yes. Can you do that with your male versus hermaphroditic worms? Uh, not quite the same because so males versus females in my our worms is actually really different from okay. males versus females of us because for us it's like the whole hormone thing. So if you can make uh, you can be kind of in between more masculine or more with circulating hormones as well as your genes. And the worm, each cell decides, I am a male, I'm a hermaphrodite, okay? So um, mostly it doesn't matter because the cells are identical. But if you had it mixed up in the male tail, it's just sad, <laughs> okay? <laughs> yes, ma'am. So it's the, she's asking about the receptor diversity versus the number. So there's, you know, 100 billion cells versus 302. But if you actually look at, say, dopamine receptors, they're the same classes of dopamine receptors in us as there are in worms. And actually some of the dopamine receptors were first discovered in worms, and then they were found to exist in people. So that, but that wasn't my lab, but that was another dopamine person. and and it was only discovered in the past year. So they don't even know what it does in people yet, but they know what it does in worms. <laughs> okay, and so they can look for changes in the behavior of what, what, what they'll next do is probably mice. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so it's pretty difficult to translate what we, what we know in worms, and it's so simple. There's so little choice to what we do in humans. And it is very difficult to, you know, say, we could actually say, okay, it was actually very shocking to me when we started studying the monomines to find out, hey, monomines regulate mood in people, and levels of activity, and those are actually the same things they regulate in worms. But what do I want to make from that? Not much. Mostly I want to see who are the molecular players that are interacting and what can they give us as a module. And then extrapolating, okay, in humans we have, you know, five orders of magnitude more possibilities, but the building blocks are going to be the same. We hope. Some of the same. Yes, sir. Um, we also look at aging. So actually all these mutants, I didn't talk about this. Some of them live longer than normal. Some of them live shorter than normal. So, and that's actually thought to be true for serotonin in people, that it has effects on like whether you live to be 65 or 75. So that's actually another whole area of stuff. That's actually something mostly I do rather than my students because you have to actually um, age the worms every day for, for 40 days until the last one dies of old age. And someday I will have a student who wants to come in every afternoon for 40 days in a row, but so far that's been me. <laughs> um, but yeah, fertility, reproduction, and you know, basically whatever a little animal can do.
Is this still live? It is. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I know it was really hot in here, but it was <laughs> worth the effort, don't you think? So um, next week, Cafe Conversation with John Gilliam, Surveillance, so Surveillance Society. He made that name intentionally, didn't he? <laughs> yes. Surveillance Society. In two weeks, back to Science Cafe with Larry Whitmer and Dinosaurs. Now, yes. <laughs> okay, for those of you who are wondering, if you want to see this again, I did get the place where it's going to be shown. All right. It is new, N-E-W, dot livestream dot com slash Ohio CAS. And we'll put this on the Twitter and the Facebook page. Yeah, we will put it on Twitter and Facebook so you can find it there as well. Um, if you want to, you can email me if you have any questions about Science Cafe, if you have suggestions. Uh, my Ohio ID is Wyatt, my last name and my first initial S. Please add the S so it doesn't go to someone else. So W-Y-A-T-T-S, you're welcome to email me anytime to ask questions or comments or make suggestions if you have people you'd like to hear for the Science Cafe. Uh, thank you guys very much. I appreciate your time.